Listeners, we want to tell you about a Reformed Baptist publishing company, Free Grace Press. Free Grace Press is firmly committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and biblical truth as expressed by the historic Reformed confessions, such as the 1689 London Baptist Confession. They seek to propagate books and tracts that are spiritually inspirational, doctrinally educational, and practically helpful for the Church of God. We want to encourage you to support this ministry by purchasing their products. So you can learn more about them at freegracepress.com. Again, that is Free Grace Press. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Jimmy Johnson here with my co-host Austin McCormick, and we have the privilege of interviewing Bill Askell on the subject of B.H. Carroll, or on a biographical sketch and some of his beliefs. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Glad to be with you today. Thanks for the invitation. And we'll just start right off. Bill, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, I'm a native of Beaumont, Texas. I'm the fifth of six children, was raised in a home where where there was a dad who who was religious, uh, was much more religious at church than he was at home. He was he was highly thought of at church. He was a Sunday school teacher, deacon. He had some real problems as a as a husband and a father, however. Uh, but my mother was a very godly woman, a tremendous influence on us, and it was, it was through her witness. Faithfully, I, I tell people all the time when I'm talking about my past that when I push back in my mind, my earliest memories I, I have are sitting on my mother's lap and she's either singing to me about the Lord or she's telling me stories from the Bible. Uh, she was faithful to take us to church, uh, march us down to church. As we got a little older, it wasn't but a couple of blocks away and she would she would drag me kicking and screaming down to the church house and uh, and through the years. So she cultivated in in all of her children, really, a very uh, a high, what I would call practical ecclesiology. Uh, the three sons, uh, good churchmen, the three daughters, good church women, a uh, high view of the church. Never tried to do Christianity apart from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the climate I grew up in. And when I was 10 years old, I, I did what every little Baptist boy was supposed to do. I, uh, I got emotional one Sunday, and I can't tell you why. Uh, I look back on it. Sometimes I think maybe, maybe my mother had given me a stern stare because I was cutting up with some of my, my fears or maybe something the preacher said. I don't know. Anyway, at the end of the service, I walked the aisle uh, with tears. Uh, the preacher said, why do you come? I said, I, I want to be a Christian. He said, wonderful, pray with me. So he prayed and I prayed. It was very, very Catholic. You know, I, I just repeated after him. It wasn't, wasn't, a, wasn't a box there, but we were going through everything you would do uh, in confession. And when he got through, he pronounced me saved. Uh, he baptized me that night. And for the next 10 years, I lived uh, doing the, everything I knew to do. I was, uh, I was Billy Baptist, you know, I mean, uh, if you open the church doors, I fell through. I was I was there for everything. I was uh, a Sunday school. I, I have to this, this day, I have little 100 uh, percent perfect attendance Sunday school pins that I got. Um, when I became a young person, uh, I would be tagged for either youth preacher for youth week or youth song leader. Um I look back on that and I think for crying out loud, why would, but anyway, so, so we went through those things. Then we had a big emphasis for, uh, we want to get youth involved in the, in the function of the church. So, so they would assign us to committees and I was on either the personnel committee or the budget committee. So that, that was it. That was, I was Billy Baptist and people would say within my hearing to my mother, you must be so proud of him. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, she should be proud of me. I mean, who wouldn't be for crying out loud? So, so that's how I live. But when I was when I turned twenty years old, I had a uh, a very sobering encounter with the Lord, and I didn't I didn't hear voices. 
uh, it, it was uh, probably I, I was got more serious about reading the scriptures and was thinking about my life. We actually had a uh, we had a youth ministry going at our church where we went from having about eight kids on uh, a Tuesday night, rec night, youth night, without a recreation building at the time, to maybe 100, 150 kids. I mean, it just swelled, and God was really ministering. So anyway, the Lord just confronted me, and I remember being gripped with this reality from the Scriptures. Your righteousness is filthy rags to the Lord. And boy, that cut me. I, and I, I mean, I cried out, Lord, what do you want? What do you want me to do? What do you want from me? And uh, and it became obvious to me that that while I had been very religious, I just had never had a saving encounter with Jesus Christ. And truth be told, I lived something of kind of a double life. I mean, uh, around mom and around church people, I was I was the typical I was the archetypical uh, young person with my peers. Uh, not so much. And sometimes they would call me out on my hypocrisy about it. And so the Lord confronted me, uh, saved me. I went to my youth minister, who's associate pastor, telling him about it. And he and his wife didn't believe it. They wanted to try, try to talk me out of it. They said, no, you never make me believe you weren't saved. And so, uh, so I went to the pastor at the time. And I was at that time, I was scripturally baptized, uh, baptized subsequent to a saving conversion. And... Uh, I hear people talk about, well, I've been baptized twice. And I said, no, you can't be baptized twice. You can you can be dipped in water once or twice or three times, but you can only be immersed biblically after conversion. That's the only time you've ever been baptized. So so I was I submitted to that. Then a few months later, the Lord began to trouble me again. And that was that really threw me for a curve because at that time I'm, I'm midway through my uh, bachelor's degree. I'm working on a uh, pre-law, planning to go into law school if the Lord would, would allow that. And it became pressingly uh, apparent or troubling that the Lord was directing me into ministry, Christian ministry. Uh, I didn't have a good pastoral model that I looked up to, really. Uh, the pastors that were, came through our church, I didn't think how this associate pastor, this youth minister, had a real impact on my life. Um, and so I went to him and his wife and I said, I said, I got to talk to you. Maybe I'm going crazy. I don't know, but I think the Lord may be calling me into the ministry. And he and his wife looked at me and almost simultaneously said to me, we wondered when you would recognize that. And so then for them, my conversion, they, they, they said, that's what the Lord was doing back then. And I, they were, they were not right, of course, but, but I understood what they were trying to say. And so it was. It was after that. Then I was. Uh, I was seriously dating a young lady that we'd grown up together in the church. In fact, we were born three days apart. We grew up three blocks apart. We went to the same church, same school, all of our lives. Um, I kidded her, and that when I was in first grade, she and a friend of her uh, chased me down, and and she kissed me. Uh, she. She says she doesn't remember that, but uh, but that was pretty traumatic for me at the time. It's a first grade boy, of course. You know, I mean, it's, it'd be like at that time, it's like someone chased me down and put dirt in my mouth or something. So, um, so anyway, when we went to, to church, the first Sunday we went, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but when we grew up, we were born, the doctor would say, you don't take the child anywhere for six weeks. Keep them inside six weeks. Don't get them out. So my mom and her mom showed up at church with us for the first time on the same Sunday. My mother went to get Karen, went to get me to pick, and they handed her Karen <laughs> by mistake, which is a whole nother discussion in itself. But and so through the years, she when she would get upset with me, she would say, "I never should have given that little dunchy girl back." So the night we got married. Uh, I looked at her, we were standing in the receiving line. I said, well, I said, you finally got that little dunchy girl you've been wanting all these years. Uh, but back to when, when the Lord began to press for me to be, to pursue ministry. I mean, I was talking, Karen and I had plans to be married. She was going to be an RN. She was pursuing nursing school. I was going to be a lawyer. And I sat down and, I said, and to talk to her and I said, I need to tell you what I think is going on with me here. And, uh, my conversion had been traumatic enough for her because it caused her real doubt about herself that if somebody is active in church as you are, was not saved, then what does that say about me? And, um, and I told her what the Lord was doing. 
and she began to weep. And it was not tears of joy. It was it was tears of terror. I mean, you know, she was not sad for me. She was terrified at the prospect that this fellow that I'm planning to marry is not going to be an attorney, but is going to be a pastor for crying out loud. And she looked at me and she said, I, I can never be a pastor's wife. I, I can't. I'm just telling you because she was a very shy person, uh, very, very shy. Um, and of course, the Lord worked all that out. We got we got married and in, uh, in June of 1974 and. Uh, the Lord's blessed our marriage, and she is a uh, a tremendous uh, pastor's wife. She's she's not one of the one of the more you know some of these pastors' wives. They teach everything, but <laughs> she's she's not out in the public like that. She's our nursery preschool coordinator. She's wonderful with children. Uh, she counsels women uh, and gives great counsel. So so that's that's been my journey. I went to Southwestern Seminary after uh, after I finished college. Went ahead and finished out. What I was studying, went on to uh, to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, got my Master's of Divinity. I left there, went to serve. My first uh, position of service was associate pastor at the Broadmoor Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. It was it was the largest church in the Louisiana Baptist Convention at the time, five thousand members. Um, it was an amazing experience for me. But in the middle of that time there, um, the Lord taught me the Reformed faith. Yeah, through another interesting set of circumstances that I won't pursue unless you tell me you want to you want to hear it. Uh, and so I went back to work on a doctor of ministry at Southwestern. And I went, full disclosure, I went with a mad on big time. I thought, how could I how could I go through the, the institution founded by B.H. Carroll, who maybe not was not a thoroughgoing Calvinist, but was a was very, very Calvinistic, and we'll talk about that in a bit, um, and not hear anything about these things. That the only thing I ever heard about B.H. Carroll was that he smoked a cigar, uh, and he was a post-millennialist. That was it. And uh, and so I, I had an attitude, I'll confess that, going back. And, uh, and because of that, I, I had some interesting encounters. This was back in the 1980, 81, the early days of the conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention. The professors at Southwestern did not know which way the wind was blowing, the way, which way this thing was going to. And so they were they, too, were very pensive and would put down anybody that that even appeared to be sympathetic to the conservative cause. And one of the things my mom taught me growing up that imprinted was the Bible is true. And anybody who questions the truthfulness of the Bible is not to be trusted. That was just, just ingrained in me. Okay. And so I knew which side of the controversy I was on. Uh, so when I got to the point where I was going to submit my proposal, uh, which by that time, because I'm, I've become a Calvinist was going to be uh, a historic Baptist approach to evangelism to to go after the decisional emphasis and those kind of things. And they rejected it. Uh, they would not accept it. And uh, and it was about that time, too, by the way, Tom Askell, my younger brother, um, who is uh, taller, uh, better looking, smarter, all those things than I am. Uh, he, he had entered the seminary uh, to work on his master's. Uh, and and about the time I was finishing up my coursework on my doctorate, um, he was pursuing his Ph.D. and was told uh, by uh, one of his mentors, if you don't if you don't distance yourself from Tom Nettles, you won't finish the Ph.D. program. And when I got wind of that, um, that upset me greatly. And so I wrote a letter to the uh, faculty and to the trustees of Southwestern Seminary, telling them, this, remember now, this is early in the conservative resurgence. Everybody's on pins and needles. And I told them, I said, I know what you're doing, what you've done to my brother. In fact, they had offered him a contract to teach, and they withdrew the contract on the basis of, of his uh, hyper-Calvinism, as it was, it was described. And so I wrote to them, I said, I know what you're doing, and if, and if you don't grant my brother a fair opportunity to finish his Ph.D., I will go to the, to the convention with this, and I will see to it that the people who've hindered him are fired from this faculty. Well, that 
pretty well ended my relationship <laughs> with Southwestern Seminary. And Tom didn't know anything about it, by the way. In fact, had he known about it, he would have said, don't you do that under any circumstance. Uh, he used to kid me about some of my uh, my letters. Uh, he told me one time, he said, your letter writing is like a man going bird hunting with an elephant gun. He hits his target, but he doesn't have anything to show for it. So um, I, I had not... Uh, I had not read Sun Tzu's Art of War at that time to know that you need to give give a place for your enemy to become your friend. <laughs> you know, just devastating. So they they backed away. Tom finished his PhD uh, and is is today one of the uh, one of the I think peerless theologians uh, on the North American continent. Very honestly. So that's my journey. After I uh, went on from Broadmoor, there was there about six years. Went to pastor a church in uh, First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana. I uh, was there almost 14 years. It was, it was, it needed reformation big time. I mean, I went in, I'd been there uh, less than three months and found out that two of my leaders were having an affair with one another, a woman and a man in leadership were having an affair. And then when I delved into it, found out that there were five such situations in the congregation that basically everybody knew, but me, uh, it didn't come up in the, in the, interview time for me to come as pastor. So uh, I had to teach uh, biblical reformation to our leadership. And a couple of the people in the leadership were involved in this. I taught our church, church discipline. And we began the process uh, in a very orderly way of uh, exercising redemptive, uh, corrective church discipline. And the Lord brought reformation to that church. It was 150 years old, not long after I got there. And uh, and so the Lord did a great work there, brought a great man in after me to continue to work. Went from there back to Shreveport to uh, to start a church, Heritage Baptist Church, and uh, was there about uh, 14 or so years. And now uh, have been at Bethel Baptist Church in Owasso, Oklahoma for the last 15 years. I did not know this when the Lord called me to ministry, but he called me to be a reformer. Uh, to work Reformation, whether it was in a, and I even did a measure of that at, at Broadmoor Baptist Church. Now, I did not have control of the pulpit, so Reformation could not come thoroughly to that church. But I was get tasked with a, a responsibility to try to cultivate a young adult class. So Karen and I took about six or eight young adults under our wing, and the Lord blessed that thing. And when we left Broadmoor, there were like 100 to 120 young adults attending that class. And that was the pool that they would draw the children's teachers from. Uh, and we were discipling them in the doctrines of grace. And so uh, it, was, it was a great thing to see. And uh, So Reformation came to First Baptist Clinton. God was mer merciful there. And this was back at a time, guys, when you're talking about, I went there in 84. There were most guys that were coming to these things these truths were being shot out of the saddle by their congregation. So the Lord was, it's not anything that I did. The Lord was just merciful to me to let me see that happen and see it through and then walk away from there with reformation blossoming and flourishing. Same thing happened when I started church. This was, this was one of the things God taught me. You tend to think, well, reformation needs to come to an established church. We started a church uh, and it was started with people who were 1689 confessionalists. But in terms of practical working out of these things, it wasn't there. So we had to bring Reformation to, to that work at Heritage. And then leaving there, coming to Bethel, uh, same thing. Bethel had, had had a couple of pastors that had been here combined almost 40 years who preached the five points. But there was not a Reformed worldview in place here. So we had to go through that here as well. And that's that's kind of my my journey. Does that evoke any questions for clarification from you? Uh, not necessarily. I, I thank you for the uh, overview of your life, and um, I'm sure our listeners will enjoy what you've given about um, your journey and your ministry. But uh, we want to talk with you a little bit about a man that you mentioned as you were telling a little bit about your life. That is B.H. Carroll. Uh, I was recently at um, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary taking a class that your brother was teaching uh, on preaching. 
And in the class, I asked him which Southern Baptists would be worthy of study other than Boyce, Broadus, and Dag. And he immediately mentioned B.H. Carroll. And so uh, he then said that you would be worthy of discussing B.H. Carroll with. And so we thank you for giving us your time to talk with us about B.H. Carroll. So can you now uh, just give our audience a biographical sketch over B.H. Carroll's life? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, if, if I can do that, uh, covering the waterfront and trying to be succinct. B.H. Carroll was uh, was born in Mississippi in uh, in December, December 27th, 1843. Uh, the family, his, his father's family consisted of 12 children. Uh, and one of his one of his siblings, J.M. Carroll, Jimmy Carroll, he would call him. Um, also became a, a very influential uh, minister uh, in Texas Baptist life. Uh, B.H. Carroll uh, family moved to Texas, uh, Burleson County, Texas, I believe is where it was. And he was uh, he was not a believer. Uh, he was uh, an agnostic. In fact, he preached a sermon after his conversion sometime. Uh, my agnosticism and what became of it. It's a great read. Um, but along the way, he went to a uh, to a Methodist uh, revival meeting, tent meeting of some sort, and it was there that he was confronted with uh, with the claims of Christ, and he was converted. Uh, now, when you look at his his life, he's typically people will tell you he made three major contributions. He's a, he's a very uh, dynamic man, a somewhat complicated man. He he was a great preacher and pastor. Uh, he was a great educator and he was a great denominational statesman back. You know, we, we need those again today. And, and uh, I've described, in fact, there was a book written about him called The, the, the Baptist Colossus. Uh, I've described him as a titan. He, he was just, he towered <clears throat> uh, in his, his ability to argue, uh, to make his case. He towered above, above people, above his peers. And and pretty much in Baptist life, in his in his tenure, I think he died uh, nineteen fourteen. Um, uh, people would call upon him if there was a movement that needed to be challenged. Uh, if there was if there was heterodoxy raising its head, uh, B. H. Carroll, uh, particularly if it, was, if it was in the Texas area, uh, would be the one summoned to speak. Uh, against it, to challenge it, to, to bring the gospel to bear and show the, show how it was lacking. This position was lacking. Um, he, I think he had, uh, three children, I believe three sons. And, uh, uh, I think was that right? Three sons. I forget that. So he ends up, uh, getting a degree, uh, from Baylor University. Uh, then he got uh, uh, he got a degree from Southern Seminary. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's one of his relatives. Carol himself never went to seminary. He never went to seminary, but he was he was a very uh, he read like depending on who you listen to. I think J.M. Carroll, his brother tells that he read either 250 or 300 pages a day uh, for for over 40 years. I just and and had an incredible uh, memory. Some people say we didn't have a photographic memory, but J. M. Carroll tells a story of going to visit him one time, and and B. H. Carroll was in his. Uh, by the way, B. H. is Benaja Harvey is his name. B. H. Carroll was in his study, and he got to talking with him, and he said, Jimmy, would you? Uh, would you go down the hall? I said, Jimmy Carroll described his his all his home as just having books everywhere. Would you go down the hall to the such and such bookshelf? Uh, and on that, uh, so many rows up, uh, there's a book, 13 books over. Would you get that book and look on page such and such and see if it says, and he gave a quote. And Jimmy Carroll says, I did that as I was, I was asked. And he said it was, he had quoted it exactly. Um, so he has an, an incredible mind. And he would take on uh, 
for example, he was he was opposed to secession when when the war uh, between the states was about to break out. Uh, he he gave very eloquent uh, speeches, and in fact, there's there's one place recorded where he where he closed one of his speeches with a a, a portion. I, I dug it up the other day uh, of a famous poem uh, of Cutter, who was. Uh, paraphrasing the, the words of Henry Clay in his Bunker Hill oration, and it goes this way. You ask me when I rend the scroll, our father's names are written o'er. When I could see our flag unroll its mingled stars and stripes no more. When with a worse than felon hand, our felon counsels, I would sever the union of this glorious land. I answer never, never. He, he felt like it was a big mistake for the South to secede and go to war with the North. And he, and he said, he said this, he said, if the South wins, it will be perpetual war. If the North wins, it will be over. But to his credit, uh, he joined the Texas Rangers uh, and on the Texas frontier and then uh, ultimately joined uh, the Confederate army, the 17th regiment of the Texas infantry at Austin. Uh, and he, uh, he fought, uh, under RTP Allen uh, and um, McCulloch's brigade. So and he, I think he fought about a year, was wounded, and uh, then was released from his service there. So even though he was personally opposed to secession, he was, uh, he was uh, principally committed to, to be the best uh, citizen and statesman he could be in Texas and in the South. Uh, some other controversies he came across there was the uh there was a fellow i think his initials were maybe was it tm martin i think um and he he was i think he joined uh the church bh carroll had become pastor at, at first baptist waco and it became obvious as this fellow was teaching that he was he was teaching a doctrine about assurance that was really off the mark um I think it became came known in some circles as, as Martinism or something. Uh, if you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved, then you've never been saved. You need to get saved now, that kind of stuff. So B.H. Carroll confronted him, uh, had him removed from membership. And then when he went to another church, contacted that church and said, this fellow's not safe. He's, he's not a safe guy. Um, he was... Uh, he was interesting. He he opposed uh, the liquor industry and was a prominent uh, speaker uh, for prohibition. Uh, he, although he himself, and we, if we talk about his his doctrines in a little bit, he himself had an attitude about the church that would have paid, placed him in the landmark camp. Uh, he opposed. Alexander Campbell and exposed him uh, for the danger that he was. Uh, and Campbell himself had some landmark tendencies about him. So when you think about B.H. Carroll, you think about a very capable pastor and preacher uh, would command an audience, very faithful to the scriptures. Uh, but he was also an educator. I mean, he, he, was traveling on train one time and went through an area in Texas and, and, and thought we need a seminary here. And then, and was, he was a tremendous fundraiser. If there was a problem with the, with Texas Baptists, if they were going to come at one time, they were coming to their annual meeting and they were, I think $7,000 short of their budget. And it was going to be catastrophic. And he uh, joined together with George W. Truett and they raised enough money and more so that when the convention was held, uh, the budget was, was solid. He raised untold thousands of dollars uh, for Southwestern Seminary to get the work going, to keep the work alive and, and flourishing. Uh, and so you see this man. Uh, one of the one of the documents I have in my library is a uh, I think it's in one of the books that was published about him, a catechism on the church covenant. One Sunday uh, when he was at uh, First Baptist Church of Waco, he published in the newspaper the week before that the service this coming Sunday would be for members only, that all members were 
uh, encouraged to do their duty and come and be present. But visitors were asked to stay away for this one Sunday. And so they come together and he he steps down from the pulpit and he has uh, he has written a catechism on their church covenant. It's a fascinating document. Uh, and if you know anything about his uh, his interpretation of the English Bible, uh, which is a commentary on all, all the books of Scripture, uh, written not so much verse by verse as it is thought by thought, uh, that several times in that, in that set, he will break out in a catechetical teaching method. He'll ask questions, what was this, what was this, what was this? And he's catechizing, that's, and that's the way he thought. And so he catechizes the church on the church covenant. And one of the things he said in there that sticks out in my mind is he says, you know, the scripture tells us, how can two walk together except they be agreed? The question is really, how can two walk together if they do not get together on a regular basis? And so he challenged the congregation on its uh, faithfulness uh, to be in attendance. And of course, he went from, from First Baptist Waco to be the president at Southwestern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary um, and protected that institution uh, to the very end. An interesting thing happened. Um, L.R. Scarborough, Lee Scarborough, was one of, was a professor of evangelism there. And, and, and uh, Carol sort of installed a, a chair of evangelism to... Uh, because he loved L.R. Scarborough. He loved his gifts. He saw him as a, as a flaming tongue for the gospel. And there's a fascinating thing that happened. Uh, B.H. Carroll was, a, it was at least a four-point Calvinist. You can find that in his writings. Um, and that, that theological influence pervaded the seminary. And L.R. Scarborough was, was very sympathetic to that. But when B.H. Carroll died, he basically had handpicked L.R. Scarborough to follow him as president at Southwestern Seminary. And L.R. Scarborough was, at the time, he was, he was open to imbibing what were called the new measures uh, coming out of the Second Great Awakening. Charles, Charles G. Finney introducing the new measures and, and, uh, and a, a reformed pastor like Asa Hill Nettleton debating Finney and pointing out the alarm of them. Even Spurgeon himself was concerned about it. B.H. Carroll was concerned about the, the, the inquiry room, the anxious bench and those things. And he, he was not inclined to them. L.R. Scarborough was different. And so L.R. Scarborough comes into the presidency. He's a dynamic preacher. Carroll was a faithful preacher. Scarborough is a dynamic preacher. And, and when, you, when you read his sermons that are in the archives of Southwestern Seminary, there's theologically, by and large, are very, very solid. But Scarborough imbibed the practices, some of the practices of Finney, and his students would go to hear him preach in the area. And what took with them was not so much the content of his sermons as the methodology he employed afterwards. And he really was one of the people that gave uh, an openness to the to the new measures uh, where at the, at the end of the service, if you if you're anxious about your soul, come come and sit here to let us know this. If you if you want to know more, come to this room and, and inquire about this. Uh, Spurgeon said at one point in one of his sermons, he said, I know what you want. You want me to invite you to the inquirer's room. You want me to invite you to the anxious bench. I say to you, no, go home, get along with God, bleed like a wounded stag until you bleed out before him. And uh, Carol would have had that, that similar sympathy. So when he died, when he was on his dying bed and he talked to L.R. Scarborough, he said, Lee, be sure that this seminary is always lashed to the cross. If heresy ever manifests itself at this school, Take that to the faculty. If the faculty will not hear you, take it to the trustees. If the trustees will not hear you, take it to the Baptist people, because you will always get a hearing among the Baptist people. And so uh, that's kind of a, a little bit of a sketch of the life of B.H. Carroll. I hope, I hope that's helpful. Is there... Uh, Anything I need to, to sketch in to, to help with that? 
No, I, I think that was clear enough. Um, but you did mention his, his role at Southwestern. Can you, you flesh that out a little bit? What was his role in its founding, his responsibilities, and, and other involvements with the seminary? Yeah, he was he was the prime mover. I mean, it was it was his brainchild, if you want to say that. He had to sell the Baptist people on uh, on the wisdom of planting a a college for preachers uh, on the plains of Texas. You know, what what in the world would you have something that far out? Because we have, after all, we have Southern Seminary, we have the the crown jewel, and that should be enough. And he's saying, no, we need we need a preacher school out west as the country is moving. So he. He argued for that. Uh, he argued that it was feasible when people said it wasn't feasible. He raised money. He, he would do things like he would ask First Baptist Waco to give him a leave of absence for maybe three or four months. And he would spend that time traveling around preaching, uh, planting the idea, and then trying to cultivate donors who would who would come forward with the money to get, the, get it going. So he was its founder, its founding president. He was... Uh, while while there was a board of trustees, like I said, this man was a giant uh, among peers. And if he came into a room, uh, he had the ability to change the dynamic of the room. Uh, yes, there were trustees, but B.H. Carroll, uh, I don't want to say, let sound wrong about this, had his way. Uh, he always made an impact uh, when he was when he was present. And so the faculty was definitely shaped by him. The, the mission of the school was shaped by him. His, his sense was that Southern Seminary was uh, uh, a school of great academics. He wanted a school that would make great preachers, uh, uh, as, as he imagined. And think about the time he's living now. Uh, this, is the, this is after the Civil War, mid to late 1800s. Uh, the Second Great Awakening is is rolling down the plains from, from the north, uh, campfire meetings, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of experience issues. And he wanted, he wanted there to be gospel preachers who were passionate, uh, but proclaiming the gospel. Uh, and you wouldn't, uh, I'd love to have heard him preach. Uh, I've got different books of his sermons, but I would love to have heard him, uh, articulate because I'm sure he was a, he was, he was a giant of a man and, and made a convincing case for the gospel. And so that's why I handpicked L.R. Scarborough. L.R. Scarborough was to, sort of the poster child of what, what they wanted preachers to become. The thing that nobody could see was that the students would not latch on to so much to, to Carroll's and Scarborough's theology as they would to Scarborough's methodology. And so the preachers of Scarborough's generation coming out of Southwestern were they weren't they weren't Pelagians by any sense of the imagination, but they were they were preaching something that would that would have represented what what Carroll believed more so what Scarborough believed, but they would apply it at the end of the service in a way that was very uh, very man centered. Uh, I read a book years ago, Reflections on Revival by Charles Finney. And it's, it's a pitiful thing to read. I mean, he, he is lamenting most of his work. Uh, he says, I fear that m most of the many, if not most of the children who profess to be converted uh, through my meetings are yet lost. Uh, I fear that I place way too much stress on man's ability and not enough on God's sovereignty. I mean, just you read through the book and it's just some letters he wrote. And so you see that kind of fleshed out, that that misdirection. Uh, but B.H. Carroll was the prime mover, the brains, uh, the one who gave birth to Southwestern Seminary. And uh, when I was there, uh, he was not, he, I wouldn't say he was dishonored. It was just sort of a footnote. Oh, yes, and B.H. Carroll founded the school. Well, what about what do we know about him? Well, he he liked to smoke cigars and was a post millennialist, and nobody's a post millennialist. Well, it just so happens when I went back to work on my on my doctorate, on my I become a post millennialist, and uh, and so there I was back at the school, and uh, was certainly out of step 
with most of the people there with everybody in my in my d men classes as well when they when the professor wanted to do a drill where we let's let's collect in the class all the premillennialists here the dispensationalists here the amillennialists here and if there's any postmillennialists so I, I walked over there and he said you're a postmillennialist i said yeah so um uh, but bh carroll was too so good company so you've given a lot of consideration to talking about B.H. Carroll as a preacher, and you've given us some examples, but uh, maybe a question to follow up on what you've said about B.H. Carroll as a preacher. Uh, in what ways can he benefit us in the pulpit as we study his works? Okay, great, great question. He wrote the uh, Interpretation of the English Bible, which is available in various volumes. You can get a six-volume work, I think, from Baker, and I've seen a 12 or 13 somewhere else. Uh, and in fact, I believe it's actually digital today. You can actually get it digitally. Um, he wrote that because he believed that anyone who had been saved by grace through faith could open the scripture in, its, in the English language and read it and understand uh, what the Lord would have him to be and to do. And, and so for him, it was so the scripture interpreting scripture. That's the first thing you learn from B.H. Carroll is the analogy of faith that sort of was, came, came as one of the fruits of the Reformation. Scripture is its own best interpreter. Um, and he would say that there's enough clear things in Scripture that if you come across the things that are not as clear, the, the fancy word is the pers perspicuity of Scripture. There's, there's enough clear things in Scripture that when you come across things that are not as clear, that you always yield to the clear. You don't you don't get bogged down or caught up in the unclear. The, and in his mind, the clear would always uh, cast light on that which is unclear. Uh, and of course, as a as a preacher, uh, preach the text, preach the text. And uh, whereas Spurgeon would say, I, I I take a text, and as soon as I get in the text, I take I run to Jesus Christ as quick as I can. B.H. Carroll was, was very Christocentric, but he was, uh, he thought, I would say this, he, he seemed to think more theologically, uh, systematically theology, theologically than Spurgeon did. Uh, and so what you said reflected in your sermon. So I would say that understand Scripture is its own best interpreter, uh, major on the things that are clear, and uh, be systematic about it. Stick to the text. But understand that the texts connect. Uh, so those, are, uh, and and I I love reading his sermons because, like I said, when I read them, I'm thinking, man, I'd love to have heard him deliver this because it's so compelling. Mm. You had mentioned in your sketch that B. H. Carroll was at least a four point Calvinist. Could could you flesh out a little bit about his thoughts on the doctrine of grace and how they kind of show up yeah. in his? Yeah, he was uh, he was convinced of total depravity, and that comes out uh, in his preaching uh, and his writing. Um, he was convinced of unconditional election, and the same thing is true. You can you can read him. At, he uh, there's one of the papers he wrote or, or sermon he delivered where he says uh, he says people accuse Calvinists of being uh, uh, what the term he used was uh, loose with their living and loose with their morals. He said, I don't know any true Calvinist that is that way. He said, when a person comes to face God and, the, and the, the, the sovereignty of God and the grace of God, he is humble to the dust and, and he rises to live a holy life. And he, and he would say Calvinism makes for men who will live holy lives. Um, and it was because of God's choice, of God's, of God's choosing, that if he's chosen us, uh, then he is, he is going to work in us. So because of that, he was, uh, he was very keen on what we would call irresistible grace, that the, that the work of the Spirit. And then, of course, perseverance and, and preservation, as pretty much any Baptist today except the Arminian Baptists <laughs> would push for perseverance and preservation, one-point Calvinist. Uh, where he where he waffled, and it's funny when you read him, because when I was doing the preparation for the paper, you'd read him sometime and he would sound like a man who believed in, in effectual atonement or particular redemption. 
but then there are others, other times uh, where it didn't come across as clearly. Uh, and I was challenged after I wrote, I presented my paper years ago, a fellow wrote and challenged me, said I'd taken Carol out of context and that he wasn't nearly as Calvinistic as I pretended he was and, and began to try to uh, dismantle it. I think he did a, did a poor job of it, but uh, because the, the information is clearly there if you read his, his sermons, read him, read him in his commentaries. You know, just, just go to those sections, those key sections in his commentaries. And he's clearly uh, sounding out uh, total depravity, unconditional election, uh, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Uh, it's on the atonement when he when he he speaks things like uh, Christ dying to expiate all sins of all people. Uh, those kind of things are are not helpful when you hear him saying that. Now, and I think we have to recognize, and and this is something that I've thought about this sometime. When I die, what are people going to say about my blind spots? You know, Spurgeon said that the best of men are at their best still just men. Uh, and we all are men of our day. Uh, and I think Spurgeon, he was dealing with hard shell Baptists. That's what you and I would recognize as, as hyper Calvinists. Uh, dealing with landmarkers in terms of how you trace Baptists back. And in fact, I think uh, I think it was his brother, J.M. Carroll, that wrote Trail of Blood. And he kind of gives this landmark position on how you trace Baptists back. Uh, when Carroll was fending off the landmarkers. Uh, one of his best friends was sympathetic to them, it turned out. So so guys find themselves in their day uh, dealing with things. When you and he's if you read his his works, he spends a lot of time going after what he calls Romanists, uh, Roman Catholics. Uh, and and so I, I think that that what he, the, the battles he was waging uh probably, this is my best guess, prevented him from staking out a really strong position on uh, on particular redemption, uh, seeing that as uh, as calling into question whether the, the love of God, the sincerity of God in the offer of the gospel. I think he landed on the wrong side of all of that. Uh, but he was very clear in the other, what you and I would call the other four points of the five points of Calvinism. Uh, and is and is and is good to read on it. He he does a thing on uh, salvation. I, I have a, somewhere in my library. I've got this graphic that was drawn of it, and he and he tries to work out a scheme where where you have God doing His part, what he calls God's part, and then man doing his part. And uh, and again, people that don't read him closely and don't read him in context will say, "Well, man, that looks like synergism to me." Like. Like man has to uh, cooperate with God for this to happen, but but you, you're not reading him right. He talks about how there's this there's this initial influence and conviction of the Spirit uh, disposing a person to, and then he works out and, and he and he gets he gets into the weeds with uh, where faith comes in all of this. Faith is God's gift for him, is what he says. Conversion is man's responsibility. And if, depending on where you read him and what you, it sounds like, sometimes he'll say that conversion, you have to turn before you can believe. And other times he's saying that because faith is a gift, you believe, which leads to turning. And so it can get a little confusing uh, if you just snatch one line here, one line there, paragraph here and there. When you read him on the whole, though, you realize that what, what he was doing. And by the way, this argument that he makes and this graph that he, I found it. Uh, J.B. Tidwell was influenced by him, and Tidwell was a professor at Baylor University, that he makes almost identical arguments. I mean, the same same language uh, that B.H. Carroll uses to try to, if you can appreciate where where things were headed, the Second Great Awakening was having the effect of washing away good, solid, orthodox Calvinism. Okay. And uh, B.H. Carroll, for example, embraced the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. If you know anything about history of confessions, the New Hampshire Confession of Faith was uh, uh, by John Newton Brown was written as what he would call an ameliorating confession to head off the war between Calvinists and a growing Arminianism in the Northeast. And so he's very, very read the New Hampshire Confession, solid on the four points I just mentioned. 
very general on particular redemption. And that was to that was to, as he imagined, to head off, find a place where where both parties, Calvinist and Armenians, could agree. The Calvinists could say, "Well, I agree with everything in that, but but, but that's not not all that can be said." The Armenian would say, "Well, I agree with that, and I'm glad it doesn't say such and such and such." And so, and so, and so that's where that confession went. And B. H. Carroll really kind of adopted. I mean, he was he was very strong on the New Hampshire Confession, even though he was familiar with the Second London. And recognize the value of it, it in, in his in his climate in his day. Uh, that's where he landed. And I think, you know, I, I've told people one of the biggest mistakes. And I mean, who am I to point out mistakes of our founding fathers in 1845? But one of the biggest mistakes they made was they did not, at that meeting in Augusta, nail down a confession of faith. They they assumed it. When you do the study on that, and I, I've done it. Every delegate, and that's what they call them, that came to Augusta in 1845 to form the Southern Baptist Convention was either personally recognized, we have documentation, personally recognized as embracing uh, Second London or what would have been called the Philadelphia or even the uh, um, uh, the Charleston Confession. They're basically the same. Or they came from a church that had adopted that confession. We know that for a fact. And so they assumed a theological unity there. But they did not nail down that. In fact, the story of Baptist life is when the argument was pitched to uh, to do that, one of our founders argued vehemently against it because he had seen what he called the unhealthy influence of creeds. Uh, the creeds led Presbyterians, Episcopalians, congregation to die to take on a, a, a aroma of death. And so he was adamantly opposed to creeds. And I think that was short-sighted. I think if, if had they nailed down a confession, it would have been what you and I recognize as a second London, probably in the form of the Charleston Confession. And think about the headaches we would have avoided uh, down the line. But it is what it is in terms of the, the Lord's providence unfolding. Uh, B.H. Carroll landed on the New Hampshire, admired the second London, but found the New Hampshire more fitting uh, for for the frontier. And again, think about it. Guys laboring on the frontier would not have had a vast, would not have been inclined to have a vast library. They, uh, uh, are, are, nor would they have had a great reading. B.H. Carroll was a was an unusual man in the West in terms of his uh, his uh, educational acumen, his his capacity to read and memorize. I don't think talk about a man that for. For 40, I think at the end of at his death, his brother said at his funeral, uh, he says at one point talking about him in 1908 that he he read 300 pages a day, three or 350 uh, for 40 years. Well, when he died, he says read uh, 300 or so pages a day for 48 years. I mean, that's phenomenal for anybody to do. And so a New Hampshire confession was more of a, was more of a summary. Uh, not as not as extensive as a second London confession. Hmm. Well, we've now uh, considered his views on the doctrines of grace and some of uh, his roles, responsibilities, and looking at him as a preacher. Uh, you also hinted at this in your sketch that uh, Carroll was post millennial in his eschatology. Can you elaborate this? Elaborate yes. on. That? Yeah, he he uh, he was very influenced by the uh, by the early. Uh, uh, Baptists, the folks who who formed the uh, London Foreign Mission Society for the propagation of the gospel. You had William Carey, uh, Andrew Fuller, uh, John Sutcliffe, John Ryland, Samuel Pierce were the five uh, English Baptist pastors that came together to 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 launch what you and I recognize as the modern missionary movement. They were all uh, influenced by this. And I believe it was Sutcliffe that wrote the uh, call to prayer uh, as they were thinking about uh, this going worldwide. Uh, that was picked up by Jonathan Edwards. And, uh, and, and all these men were, were post-millennial in, term, in their theology. They believed uh, that, that Jesus, who, had, who was reigning victoriously in heaven, would reign uh, victoriously on the earth. And B.H. Carroll was very influenced by that and he he embodied that and he he said one time he said he said Christ is 
victorious in heaven, how can we question whether or not he will be victorious on earth? And when he returns, uh, he will come uh, as, as a conqueror. And now what happens in post-millennialism, though, is you have a, a, a 20th century uh, liberal approach to post-millennialism that says that man is getting better and better. Uh, things are getting better and better. And when Jesus comes, he's going to come back to an earth that, that t- took him seriously and applied what he said. And he's going to be welcomed back to it. Well, that's, that's not Puritan post-millennialism at all. And the and the pure and the postmillennialism of our of our Baptist fathers in England that started a, a foreign foreign mission movement of uh, Jonathan Edwards of B H Carroll and others was a uh, was seeing that that whatever we go through, for example, if the church goes through persecution, it goes through persecution to be purified, to be adorned as a bride prepared for the return of the Savior. And and it, and it gave him a, gave B. H. Carroll a very hopeful uh, view of things. I, I really think, you know, different things drive different people. And I and I and I have to be honest. I'm a post millennialist who who tries to continue to be hopeful. All right, um, B. H. Carroll was not afflicted like that. I mean, he he was a very hopeful man. I mean, he just and so I think it's what it's what drove him that if if a need was presented to him. If, if this is if this is to advance God's kingdom, God wants his kingdom to advance and he would give himself to it with every expectation that it would come to pass. Uh, and I think that's a part of his usefulness. I've known a man like that in my life, Errol Hultz, uh, who was the editor of Reformation Today in England, uh, came came to America and we became fast friends. And he he was he was that way. It was just like you couldn't set anything before him that he did not see the hopeful prospect of the advance of the gospel in it. Um, and so B.H. Carroll, I think, would agree today with Douglas Wilson uh, and call this predominant view pessimillennialism that seems to have, have overtaken a lot of people, you know, a very pessimistic view. Uh, B.H. Carroll understood that Christ is King of kings of Lord and Lord of lords. He reigns in heaven. He will come. When he comes, he will reign on earth. Uh, and, and everything that he desired, he will get everything he's purposed. This is what made him interesting to me in terms of his view of the atonement. Because for the atonement, my question I ask people is, does Jesus Christ get what he pays for? If he does, then you have landed in the arena of particular redemption or effectual redemption. And so while B.H. Carroll waffled on that, Giving, giving implication that there would be people that Jesus was dying for who would not be finally in heaven. It was, it was an interesting read for me as I studied him years ago, that he was so hopeful that Christ would have all of his desires fulfilled. This was a disconnect for me. But yes, he was a, uh, he, he was a Puritan post-millennialism. If, you've, if you're not familiar with that, I would commend to you the book by Ian Murray, uh, The Puritan Hope. It's a great read, and it talks about the some of these guys that started the foreign mission society and it traces it out uh, to the call to prayer. Mm. Thank you for, for delving into that and explaining some of that, especially connecting it with the Baptist mission society. I always found that fascinating when I studied them, it it was eschatological views that drove what they did. Um, Remember, Jimmy, that uh, somebody said that it was supposed to be John Ryland, but uh, John Ryland Jr. said my dad never said it. Someone said at one of uh, Kerry's meetings, sit down, young man, you're a fanatic. If God wants to save the heathen, he'll save them without your help. Uh, but yet Kerry was launched because of this, this eschatological view that God, there will be a people from every tribe and nation under heaven gathered before the throne. We must go. God intends for us to take the gospel. The people from these tribes might be gathered. It was a very, very bold. And and, and uh, Andrew Fuller said to him, if you've studied Andrew Fuller, you know, he said, look, we cannot go down in the well with you, but we will hold the rope when you go down. And we will, we will pray for you and support you in this. Um, with that said, we're going to transition a little bit and, and, 
what are some of Carol's most important work and where would you point someone who wants to start studying him? Well, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of his books are not in print now. He would write books of sermons and there were people who collected books of addresses that he gave that, that, that I think is, I think Cranfield, uh, I think J.B. Cranfield was a, was a, a, a peer and he really is one of the ones personally responsible for, for putting together a lot of Carol's things. The interpretation of the English Bible was his, you know. Um, so I would, I would, first of all, I would use, take advantage of Google and do a Google search for B.H. Carroll uh, works. Okay. And you'll come up with, there are actually pages that are, uh, that have taken some of his works and put them into a format where they're available online. That's a good thing. Um, and then I would, uh, I would start tracing out uh, bibliographies. There's a, uh, uh, B. H. Carroll on the church is very fascinating uh, because he he just did not see a universal church at all. Even when you read his exposition of Matthew 16, which you would think, well, surely he's going to wrestle this. But I'm going to tell you what influenced him. He was so opposed to the Roman Catholic idea of the church that I think it really uh, it affected his view, and he argued. Uh, I think it's in his in his uh, book Ecclesia. Uh, he argued that the church is the local church, and uh, was just was very. That's why people say, "Well, he was a landmarker." No, he was an anti-Catholic. He was he was so concerned about that the the idea of the Pope and the you know that he he went way out of his way. And some again, these guys are men of their time. So he he that's, you know look at Martin Luther, um, Martin Luther for all that he did, never separated uh, Germany and, 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 and Lutheranism. He felt like they needed the state to, to keep the church uh, healthy and strong. We look at that and go, how could you do that? But, uh, but B.H. Carroll on the local church. So, but I think his, his book, Ecclesia, I think uh, one on, uh, is it Baptist Distinctives? I think it's the name of one of them. It's a really good read, and you'll pick up his uh his uh, uh, anti-Catholicism there. Um, he's very keen. In fact, I think it's in that book that he does this uh, God's purpose in, in saving a person. He shows this God's part, man's part. The graphic is not in all the editions, but but it is in some of them. Um, there's that. There's, a, there's I think, J.B. Cranfield put together sermons and addresses by B.H. Carroll. There's a, he, he gives a sermon at the what was it maybe the hundredth so the hundredth anniversary of the of the of the 1792 William Carey launching I think it's either that or the hundredth anniversary of the tricentennial convention and he gives an address that it's just a hundred years of, ba of Baptist life and wonderful wonderful uh, view so I would say do a Google search. Uh, you come across, I uh, think somebody's maybe Southwestern Seminary or somebody has some archives of his writings. A lot of them have been uh, converted digitally. Some of them have not. But you, you'll see a bibliography of what he did. And then anybody that would ever have the opportunity to be on Seminary Hill in Fort Worth, uh, I would go to the library, see if I can get permission to go to the stacks and, uh, and read through his materials there. Uh, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm at home today, so I'm not sitting in my library. I've collected several of Carol's works through the years. When the Lord taught me the doctrines of grace, I had people where I was serving tell me that I was a Presbyterian, that I was not a Baptist anymore. And, and uh, my good friend Tom Nettles encouraged me to start uh, doing, collecting a bibliography, uh, which I did. And B.H. Carroll was one of those that I, that I went after and collected a lot of his works to have to show people uh, you're mistaken, you know. And so they say, well, you're a deep water Presbyterian. I know I'm a, I'm a historic Baptist. I'm a historic Southern Baptist. And, uh, and make the case for that. Bill, what final encouragements would you like to offer to our listener about B.H. Carroll or his life or his theology or his influence to Christians 
and or Baptists? That's a good. Good question. He he was a uh, he was a a churchman par excellence, and I think we need that today. Um, we're not having the influence on our culture as we ought because church members are half-hearted. Uh, we discovered, I think, I think we've seen in this whole COVID-19, whatever it is, um, that there were people who thought themselves to be really strong church members who've shown otherwise in this. The opportunity to not meet for a few weeks became the excuse for them to stop meeting, essentially. Uh, and and so B.H. Carroll uh, would have nothing of that. He was a strong, strong churchman. And uh, I would also suggest people read him. You, because so many things are digitally available, if you're if you're if you're a teacher, Sunday school teacher, get access, which you can. You can access every one of his commentaries on uh, the interpretation of the English Bible, and read those sections that you may be studying or preparing to teach. They're not going to give you verse for verse like some commentaries do, but the sense for sense and the idea is very rich. Uh, he's in Ephesians four, for example, uh, he argues for creeds. Uh, and one of the things that the moderate Southern Baptist told us when we first started the battle for the Bible was Baptists have never believed in creeds. They've never even used the word creed. And you have B.H. Carroll say this cry today uh, less creed and more liberty is like an argument from the vertebrate to the jellyfish. And he says, a church with a little creed is a church with a little life. Enlarge your creed and you will enlarge the life of your church. And he makes a strong appeal uh, out, of the, out of the passage in Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, makes a strong appeal for, for a good confessional identity. Uh, and that's something that uh, that is missing today in a lot of churches. Even pastors are pastors are loosey goosey. It's not it's not unusual to go to a church and say, um, "What's your confession of faith?" Well, I don't know if we have one. Okay, okay, right. Well, what about your church covenant? Well, I don't think we have one of those. And, and you say, you know, how long have you been around? How long has your church been in existence? Because I promise you, if it was founded properly, a confession of faith was identified. A, a church covenant, a strong a background as Bethel Baptist Church has before I got here. I mean, we're talking about tremendous preaching before I got here. They couldn't tell you what their church covenant was. And it was a difference in having a someone, and I don't, I don't want to speak demeaningly of anybody, someone who was committed to five points versus someone who's committed to a reform worldview. B.H. Carroll had a worldview. And, uh, and we can learn from him in terms of being being faithful members of the church. I would, I would encourage if someone can find his uh, catechism of the church covenant, uh, we've actually, I took that and reworked that to use with our own church covenant one time and just went through it with our people. Um, and I think that's another, to, in, to instruct parents, recognize the value of a catechism and incorporate that into your education of your children. I got through Southwestern Seminary with a master's degree and was introduced to catechisms. Growing up in Beaumont, Texas, I would have told you that a catechism was some sort of Catholic something that they did. So my friends, my friends had catechism at the Catholic school, you know. I found out, no, it's, it's actually a Greek word, catecheo, which means to instruct. And, and Karen and I began catechizing our children. And I learned as much theology catechizing my children as I did studying systematic theology at Southwestern Seminary for my master's. And so Carol recognized the value of a catechism. Uh, and then I would say that if you want to, to strengthen your idea of the church, read him on the church. He, while he may be skewed a little bit on the church universal, uh, his, his writings on the local church are rich. Uh, and very helpful for anybody who wants to who wants to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and become a mature disciple and follower of Christ. Well, Bill, we want to thank you for taking uh, this time to 
uh, give us uh, our, and our listeners a little bit about you and a little bit about BH Carroll. And thank you for these encouragements you've offered us. And once again, thank you so much for joining the Covenant Podcast today. Thank you for the invitation. I've enjoyed being with you guys. God bless you in your endeavors. And to our listeners, we want to wish you grace and peace. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.